Hallo allemaal, welkom bij de In Intense Reis podcast. Mijn naam is Marije Hofland, ik ben auteur van het gelijknamige boek. In mijn boek uh, beschrijf ik waar wij als gezin tegenaan uh, lopen op onze zoektocht naar passend onderwijs, zelfacceptatie, hulp en het herstel van schooltrauma. Uh, met het schrijven van dit boek wil ik mijn steentje bijdragen om ervoor te zorgen dat deze reis voor anderen een stukje makkelijker wordt. Uh, voor onze zoon zijn school en de maatschappij niet altijd de makkelijkste plekken. En een van de eigenschappen die ik eigenlijk heel erg mooi aan hem vind, maar die hem ook heel erg in de weg kan zitten, is zijn gevoel van rechtvaardigheid. Op het moment dat dingen in de wereld of in zijn directe omgeving oneerlijk zijn, ja, dan kan hij dit eigenlijk niet uh, loslaten. En het is voor mij als moeder heel erg moeilijk om te zien dat veel zaken hem zoveel pijn doen of echt in de problemen brengen. Uh, en het is voor hem heel erg lastig om hiermee om te gaan. Ik heb dan ook heel erg veel vragen over dit onderwerp en die wil ik heel erg graag stellen aan mijn gast van vandaag. Hopelijk word ik er wat wijzer van en uh, zal het het leven van mijn zoon uh, iets makkelijker maken en ik hoop jullie ook. Een tweede onderwerp waar we, van, waar we het vandaag over gaan hebben is asynchrone ontwikkeling. Cognitief loopt onze zoon voor op zijn leeftijd, maar qua andere zaken is dit echt niet het geval. En vaak wordt er wel door volwassenen verwacht dat dit eigenlijk gelijk is loopt. Nou, voor ons is dit ook een heel erg lastig uh, iets waar wij tegenaan lopen en ook om deze reden vind ik het heel erg fijn en waardevol dat ik het hier vandaag over kan hebben. Mijn gast van vandaag is Matt Zakreski. I will continue in English since Dr. Matt is an American psychologist, gifted expert and international speaker. Uh, the webinars he gave are among the best I have ever uh, seen. So if you haven't seen, uh, seen them, please register because they're absolutely worth it. Um, I love the way that he shares his knowledge in an accessible and practical way. So once you've seen a webinar, um, you take things out of it that you can start working on. Plus, he's an absolutely funny guy and he always makes me laugh. And no matter how hard the subject is, You know, once I um, exit the webinar, I'm always thinking, um, you know, I can do this. I will do this. So hopefully we will leave you today um, with the same feeling after we've done this podcast. Welcome, Matt. I'm so glad that we're able to have this talk today. Well, and so am I. And thank you for the lovely introduction in two languages, which is at least one more than I usually get. <laughs> <laughs> um, and... And, you know, it, it's a pleasure to give these webinars and it's a pleasure to have you in the audience because you bring a, a willingness to engage openly and authentically that even as a speaker, it, it comes across. And oh, that's nice. You know, you know and it, it's a two way street, right? I mean, the energy I bring is picked up by you and given back to me. And, you know, I think, you know, when one of us do, does better, we can all do better. So that's a, you know, we're a good team. Is Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are and it's a good thing you you just make me engage and when i do i'm hoping that other people will as well and that they take uh, much more out of it than they would otherwise if they just kept quiet so yeah um during my introduction which you probably um couldn't understand because it was in dutch but i already told uh the people listening that one of the most difficult things that my son has to deal with is his sense of justice. We know other uh, kids in his uh, surroundings, for example, my, my, my nephews, and they, um, uh, they, they care about the things that happen in the world. So the, the, the difficult things that happen in the world, but they kind of like acknowledge it and then they can move on with their own life. But for our son, it's like um, basically almost like it burns his soul, like it just sticks in there and then he can't sleep for days and he just can't let it go. Like, for example, uh, we were watching the news and it was about the, the, the kids being separated at the U.S.-Mexican border. And that was the worst thing that he could imagine, like being separated from his parents and being there all alone. Um, so that really affected him. And he was uh, talking about it constantly and he couldn't sleep at night. And he was afraid um, about, you know, us not being there anymore. And he, he was just afraid, he was mad and he couldn't, he really, really couldn't let it go. Um, 
Yeah, is, is this something that you often see when working with children? Yes, and let me start by saying that I agree with your son. You know, I, I do mean, too. It, <laughs> I, you know, it's it's heartbreaking. It's shattering, and and the idea here is the older our brains get, the better we get at compartmentalization, right? Mm -hmm. This is the thing I'm thinking and feeling right now, and I'm going to put it over here until I'm in a position to deal with it, whether mm -hmm. that's right now and in, in five minutes or two days from now. And the younger we are, the more immediate everything is. You know, I, I often say to gifted kids and the parents of gifted kids that gifted kids have no sense of time. Yeah. You know, a kid will look you in the eye and say, you're the worst thing that ever happened to me. And 10 minutes later, can I have some biscuits for a snack? Because time doesn't mean anything. It's Absolutely. I'm feeling this right now. And thus, it's the only thing I'm feeling, the only thing I'll ever feel until it's over and I feel something else. Yeah. Right? So our brains have a sense of time. Our brains see, you know, you know, the stream of things as a parade from above. But when you're a kid, it's this, this is what's happening right now. It's a bunch of snapshots as opposed to a movie. And this is something that we just have to be patient, that it's something that they need to develop, or is it something that basically you can teach them? Because I can tell him that, but it doesn't feel like it's coming across because it's so intense and he, it's just... Um, whenever I'm telling it, it seems to be just words. It doesn't seem to be something that sticks with him. Yeah. Well, so if you think about this, so one of the things I like to model is what I call bottom up thinking, yeah. right? So in this version, the top version of the best outcome is we calm this kid down, whether it's your son, or one of my clients or, yeah. you know, a student at school, et cetera. And, and that's a, that's a great outcome to want. The idea is that's the hardest outcome to get. So let's instead invert the staircase and start at the bottom. So the 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 lowest barrier to entry here, the the thing that you can do if you can't do anything else, is sit there and witness it and let it wash over you. Yeah. And this takes a lot of discipline. It's really hard to do. But when parents are out of gas, when they're exhausted when teachers are just fed up, you know, sometimes it's as simple as I want to know everything, you know, about this, I'm going to sit here and I'm just going to witness it. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to push back. I'm just going to listen. And, and it's hard because our kids are in pain, but there is a, there's a moment where sort of they can come around the bend of their own pain and realize through talking it out that, okay, I feel a little bit better now that I've said yeah. these things out but also sometimes talking things out gives you some perspective that you didn't know you had. So that's, that's a key thing. Exactly, exactly. Because that would give us also the opportunity to, again, um, watch the news with him and discuss, that, uh, discuss it with him. So after a while, he may learn to deal with the things and he he also may learn to express himself in a better way when it comes to uh, to feeling so it could be a win-win yeah. situation there thank you yeah <laughs> and <laughs> you know and it's one of those things um i just wrote an article about this um for the saying newsletter um mm -hmm. and but one of the things we talked about is you know i had a young man who was equally distraught by the australian wildfires which yeah. you know yeah just like kids being separated at the border is this, oh my gosh, how are we not talking about this? How are we not freaking out about this, you know, piece of news? And, you know, he was walking at school in America, thousands of miles away or kilometers, thousands of kilometers <laughs> away um, and couldn't focus on math, couldn't focus on lunch, couldn't focus on music because I mean, but Australia is on fire. Dr. Matt, what do I do? Exactly. Yeah. And so the idea here is, is oftentimes when we get so overwhelmed by our kids' emotion, right? It puts us in a position of angrily redirecting it back to them and say, fine, what do you want me to do about it, right? And it comes across in that tone, we're frustrated, we're angry. We're like, I'm overwhelmed that you're overwhelmed. So like somebody help me out here. Yeah. And then our kids get defensive and the problem gets bigger, not smaller. So once we've heard everything or once we have an idea of where it's going 
the first thing we do is we we establish unity we establish teamship we say i agree with you you know maybe i didn't know about this now i do and i totally agree with you or yeah i i i i couldn't agree more about this and then we use the we language we say so what can we do yeah now what can you do cuz that can feel a little threatening right but it's this what can we do about it you know and i'm open to ideas there are no bad ideas do you want to sell some cookies and raise some money and send it to organizations that help people at the border do you want to talk to um your you know one of your teachers at school and see if there's a letter writing campaign you can do or can we tweet about it or you know and the idea is we don't want to move too quickly into action right we don't want mm-hmm. to okay you're sad what do we do about it like bam bam like i can't sit with this feeling we also don't want to wallow in it, right? And we just sort of sit there and I'm sad. Yeah. I'm going to be sad forever. Because, you know, <laughs> that's not either. It's that middle ground. And as a parent, as a psychological professional, as a teacher, this is a moment where I'm going to tell you, trust your instincts, yeah. right? When your instincts tell you that it's time to switch it, or when you start to feel like you're getting activated, that's a great time to to say, hey, this is a lot to hear. So I know it's a lot for you to experience. So let's switch. Let's talk about something different. Where do we, how do we use this emotion, right? Do we just sit here and sob in our dining room or do we, you know, or do we try to redirect this into something? And maybe, maybe we just, we both do a little bit of research on our computers and find an organization or a, a movement that we can join or maybe it's something that right now we need to journal about it or do some art about it or go for a run. I mean, there's there are ways to metabolize that energy to get it out in an expressive way. And for some of my kids, it's, um, um, you know, it's as simple as I need to just move my body right now. Yeah, I need to put on some music and I need to just jam or dance or, you know, one of, one of my kids... Um, he, uh, he plays lacrosse <clears throat> and when he's really activated, he goes to the concrete wall at his school and just throws the ball against the wall as hard as he can for yes. a half hour, for minutes. You know, he'll come back, he'll drenched in sweat, but he's like, I feel better. I got those, I metabolized those feelings. So, you know, having that, that deep suite of different tools we can use becomes our, our biggest benefit as parents and educators and, and mental health professionals, because the feelings are real. The feelings are disruptive and intense and painful. Kids share a fraction of the pain they feel. So if you feel upset and sad and scared by something your kid is telling you, well, they probably feel mortified, panicked and distraught, right? We're gonna use all our vocabulary (laughs) words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good thing to realize as well, because he doesn't really he doesn't often share his emotions so when he does then there's really something going on that he can't handle it on his own so that's a good thing to realize for me as well awesome you know and i think that this is where helping kids to understand their brains comes in if you you know if we can share a little bit about you know, what these feelings, like how, how their brains work, why they're, why they're feeling these things so deeply, it's not going to break this cycle, but it's going to give them some context for what's going on and maybe makes it a little easier to break that process. Um, I think that would be good for him as well. When we explain things to them, to him, he can basically match his emotions to like his cognitive level. So he has two entries there and then you know uh, we found out then that it's easier for him to deal with things when we can explain why things are happening to him and why he's feeling things a certain way and why things impact him maybe a little more than uh, than other kids around him we feel like whenever we explain something to him um things got easier for him to uh to deal with as well so yeah we try and do that as often um as we can because one of the things that i was actually 
afraid of and which made us basically stop watching the news as often as we do, uh, as we did, um, was that I was actually afraid of what it was going to do with him. And you read a lot about um, like uh, existential depression. And I um, actually wrote, wrote a little piece about that in my book as well. Um, and I don't think it's an official diagnosis, but I know it's something that is really, really real. Yeah. Um, and it's really painful for him. And I was actually afraid that if he would like uh, take on all the problems uh, in the world and would feel everything as intensely as he does, that that was something that he could actually develop. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you share a little bit about what existential depression is uh, and if people recognize that, you know, how can they find help as parents and what can they do? And, you know, existential depression is something that it's not a formal secondary diagnosis. So I wouldn't give you that specific code if I was diagnosing you, uh-huh. but it's a descriptive term we can use within the diagnosis. So it's, yeah. you know, the code is F33.1 um, <laughs> because I do this a lot, right? Yeah. And then you, and then you can click down and it says existential, right? So it gives us a flavor of depression because, you know, if you wanted to compare that to sort of garden variety depression, right? The intervention's a little different because mm-hmm. we are seeking meaning in a universe that is, ex- that is fundamentally meaningless, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't say that to be macabre or nihilistic. I just, it's, we are specks of dust on a yeah. ball flying through the universe, right? It's, it's just- We're all just it's, stardust. <laughs> we're all just stardust, right? And I had the I had the good fortune to fly out to Los Angeles, California in the United States uh, a while ago to do some work in the gifted community. And our, on our flight out there, we had some terrible turbulence, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we were bouncing up and down and the woman next to me was very pale, very scared. And she, she said to me, once we got through it, she goes, why were you so calm? And people say these things to me all the time, actually. And I said, and I, I said, well, honestly, because what am I going to do? You know, there's nothing I can do to make the plane not crash. You know, I can sort of cross my fingers and hope for the best. And, and it's easy to frame that approach to it as giving up, right? I have no control. Thus, I'm not going to try. Thus, life's, life is terrible. I think it's a different thing. Yeah. I think that understanding one's role in the universe is gaining control by understanding you have no control, right? I can't control if a if an airplane crash lands on my house right now. It's it's going to ruin the podcast. I, I that I, I apologize. <laughs> there's no way that's not going to mess up the podcast. Um, but there's also if I chose to live my life in fear of airplanes falling on me, I would never do anything. That is, you know. True. So we can acknowledge that it's scary. We can acknowledge that it's overwhelming, but we use that knowledge to guard ourselves against the sense that all I can do is focus my attention on the things I can control. Yeah. So you actually have that circle of control and when mm -hmm. things are beyond your control. Right. Yeah. You know, and an example I use a lot, um, do you, um, do you drive? Do you, do you drive a car? So would you say you're a good driver? I'm all right. <laughs> so, so when I come out I, there, I haven't maybe killed anyone drive yet. You. I... <laughs> you'll be safe. You'll be safe. I'm not sure about my car, but you'll be safe. Thank you. So <laughs> let's say I fly out there, right? You pick me up at the airport and we're driving to wherever we're going. And you're a good driver, right? You are, we're both wearing seat belts. You're following the speed limit. And then all of a sudden, a tree falls in the middle of the road, right? So we slam into it. Now, Are you a good driver? Yes. Yeah. Good drivers get into car accidents? Sure. Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Could a good, is there anything you could have done to avoid the tree that fell in our way? No. No. Not, Not, 
at hinds in, in hind hindsight, but not at the ah, time. Yeah. The, and that's and you spoke to this beautifully because what when we're deep into existential depression, it's our hindsight that hurts us. If yeah. only I had done this differently. If only I had been able to see the future and thus I would have made a different decision, but we can't, you know? And I often joke that, you know, I let my kids say basically whatever they want to say in therapy with me, they can curse, they can talk smack about whatever they want to say, but the word I don't want them say is should. Yeah. And, you know, in an American English, right? It's, it's this idea of something, it's a value judgment. You should do this. Yeah. You should be this. I say it's the, it's the possibility of the word could with shame attached to it, right? Absolutely. Because, you know, to the best of my knowledge, you are not on the Olympic team for your country. I mean, you're not in Tokyo right now, right? No. <laughs> you know? And, but probably you played some sports as a young kid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we, so if your brain is telling you, well, you should be on the basketball team or the handball team or the water polo team your brain is hurting you and blaming you for something that hasn't happened. But if we change the word should to could, you could be on one of the Olympic teams for whatever reason you're not. And those paths you took aren't better or worse. They are just different. And if Absolutely. we can, if we can change should for could, then I think what happens is we take a big step towards being kinder to ourselves and breaking that existential depression. Yeah. Plus it gives you options. Op and options are key, right? Depression exactly. is depression wants us to think we are hopeless, helpless, and worthless. And, and since I know you're none of those things and none of us are, you know, these, this kind of thinking provides a counter narrative, right? Something else for our brain to focus on that is really different than then I'm just, that I'm just bad and things will always be bad and they'll never get better. And life has no meaning because life, have, life has lots of meaning. It just might not be the meaning we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Some, some good food for thought there as well. I'm just going to try and think how we can, uh, um, you know, match that in a Dutch language as well. So I'm going to think yeah. about that and I'm probably going to, uh, write a blog about that as well, because I think that the, the message itself is really, really strong. So um, yeah, I'm going to try and make a translation uh, for that as well to see how we can match that into the Dutch language. Um, Sorry yeah. if I made your job harder. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you made my job more fascinating. So that's a good thing. They, that and that's a great reframe what you did right there right you, yeah. you know and one of, one of the other things because these are all things that are basically beyond his control like for example you know you're watching the news you're watching the wildfires you're watching uh the children at the border they're all things um you could control to some extent but they're all like far away from you um, but for our son, it's also um, like when he sees ki kids being bullied at school and he's been bu bullied a lot for being uh, different. So that is something that really, really hurts him to his core. Um, when he sees other kids being bullied, uh, basically he just has to do something. So he's going to confront whoever is bullying other children like every time. Mm -hmm. it's not like it's it's not eight out of ten times it's like ten out of ten times because um he just cannot handle seeing anyone being bullied um so basically when he confronts them there are two options like either they're going to stop and acknowledge that he's right and they're going to stop bullying this other kid or they feel attacked and they're going to attack him for who are you to confront me with this? Um, and um, especially when they're larger kids, cause he's like 10 years old, but he would easily confront someone who's like 16, 17, 18, he doesn't care. It's the, the, the thought itself that counts. And that the fact that you shouldn't bully anyone and it doesn't matter whether you're like this big or that, that big, it, it doesn't okay. really matter. 
Yeah, and he also has like a school trauma and a large part of that trauma is actually, you know, feeling different and being bullied. Um, so basically when people continue to bully other kids, that could also trigger this trauma for mm -hmm. him. Um, and then when it does, it, it's like... Um, he's out of his window of tolerance. So he, he doesn't, he just gets mad. He get, gets into a fight response and he could just start a fight with someone. And then it takes him, you know, it, it takes a while because before he's back into his own world and he's able to control himself again. Um, but at first when he's confronting them, it's, um, it, it, it's a conscious action. Yep. So, um, you know, that's something that he still has a choice over. And for me as a mom, it's really difficult because I admire him that he doesn't want other kids to be bullied. And I feel that he's right. And people, should, especially kids, they shouldn't bully each other because we all know how it can affect uh, yep. kids. But I'm also really, really worried because, you know, he's the one getting into trouble. And the kids that he's defending, you know, they're long gone. They, they, they've gone to play, to, to play somewhere else. And he's still, you know, like um, uh, fighting their fight and they're like somewhere else. Yeah, I'm not, not, not sure whether they're having fun, but at least they got themselves out of the situation and he's the one fighting. Plus, you know, when, 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 when he is fighting, then he's also the one getting blamed by the adults. Yep. And I'm really afraid that if he doesn't, if he won't be able to control himself, that after a while, you know, he'll be uh, kicked out of school, kicked out of the sports team, kick, just for not being able to control himself. Yeah. Um, is there any way or do you have any suggestions how we can help him to realize that you know not every fight is a fight that he has to like take on yeah. so thankfully there are some strategies for this and you know so if psychology is anything it's the art of holding two different thoughts in our head at the same time and a lot of times that's where I start my intervention in a case like this, because it's, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm not asking them to choose because they can't choose right yeah. now. They're at war with themselves. So we know bullying is bad. Bullying has terrible outcomes for the kid who's being bullied, the school environment, and also bad outcomes from the kid who's doing the bullying. So bullying is just one of those things. It's just bad across the Absolutely. board. Yeah. Right. We also know that it's reasons are deep and complex and personal. So if I'm an outside person to a situation where someone is getting bullied, I can't stop it. It's out of my control. I'm allowed to be upset by it. I'm allowed to want to do something about it. And it's good to upstand for our, um, for our friends, right? Yeah. Hey, we don't talk like that here. Or, hey, you should leave them alone. Or, hey, if you keep doing this, I'm going to get a teacher. Those are all okay things to say. Um, but what our gifted kids tend not to understand is, and there's two layers to this. The first is if it's not actually bullying, right? There's a thing we call affiliative teasing or joking teasing, yeah. right? That the kind of calling people names, you know, teasing somebody, laughing and joking that friends do to friends that- yeah often our kids who can be very literal don't understand. I, um, I, I coached a, um, a, a Frisbee team for our gifted students out here in, uh, in the States. And, you know, they're playing and they're, they're sort of, they're saying some not super kind things to each other as they play in a game, but they're laughing and joking and they're, it's within the broader idea of yeah. contact and, co and competition. And one of the dads came over to me, he's like, I don't like their language. I don't like what they're saying. I said, this is how kids connect. This is, this is an, trust me, it's an okay thing right now. I will tell you if it stops being that way, because when it does stop being joking, teasing and turn into the sort of mean spirited, painful, hurtful bullying, 
our kids are still going to want to intervene. And now they're more justified in doing so because it's a painful yeah. thing and they, you know, we want it to stop. So one of the things I like to say to kids is that there's a difference between kid jobs and adult jobs. And a kid job in that situation is not to stop the bullying because kids can't stop other kids from bullying. Yeah. It's a kid job to take it to the next person who's an adult. And whether that adult is the teacher or the school counselor or a psychologist or a security guard or whatever it might be, right? That's your job. So we're going to redirect your energy of, I want to do something. I want to help to, I'm going to find the person who can do something, the person who can help. And, and sometimes kids will say to me, I don't want to do that. I, the adults don't care. The adults won't do it. Yeah. Sure. That's a possibility, but the adults won't do it and can't do it unless we give them the opportunity yeah, to do it. They so. don't know. Then. They, don't, they don't know. They're never going to solve the problem because they don't really know it's a problem. And so it, there's this sort of, there's this sort of funny idea about allowing bad things to happen and trusting that the system that you're in will, will take care of it tricky thing it's tricky for a lot of our kids it is um, very tricky because yeah. we've obviously uh, told him you know go get the teacher and don't take on this fight by yourself um and sometimes sometimes he does we we see that he does that more often uh, than he used to at least um but it's not you know, we don't really feel that it's part of his system still to uh, to do that. So that's probably something that we have to mention over and over again until he feels, you know, and he has to experience that it's actually working um, yeah. for it to become part of his system, right? Right. And and you can and you can help him to see outside of himself in those mm -hmm. moments. And you can say things, you know, one of the things I say to my kids a lot is you can't care about this more than the person it impacts. Yeah. Right. You can't, you know, if you, if kid A is bullying kid B and kid B goes, oh, well, and skips off to the playground, that there's, that is your guidepost. That is the way to handle this. Well, I don't want to handle it that way. Bullying is bad. Bullying is objectively bad, but for whatever reason, this particular situation ended up not bad. That's a gift. That's a gift from exactly. the universe, right? Let's, it, let's embrace that. And then maybe it's an opportunity to connect with that person and say, hey, what helped you handle this this way? How can I learn from you to be a little bit more, you know, easygoing or a little bit more compartmentalized with this? And, you know, kids who have a deep, um, you know, good sense of self, kids who have, a, you know, a well-defined sense of their own worth and values are tend to be more able to sort of let that stuff go and let bullying slide off them. Yeah. So that's yeah. often a good place to start. And it's like, hey, if they're doing this, maybe the, maybe their secret, right, is that they know that their worth has nothing to do with what this other person is saying to them. And that can be a tricky thing to wrap your head around, right? Because it's, well, how do I know what they're feeling? You don't, but you can get a, a, a lot of information, a positive guess based on their actions. And that can, that can sort of let our kids use their super brains for good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. It gives me a lot of like practical things to, to try as well and, and um, share with uh, his school or wherever he is to open up conversation there as well, because it's mostly it's happening when I'm not there. But I think this will be a good thing, you know, if they talk about this in class um, as well. Um, yeah, one other thing that we also promised uh, the listeners to talk about is uh, asynchronous uh, development. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that our son is struggling with um, um, as well. I remember when he was um, learning how to read and write, 
um, then that was something that he could do um, easily. Like within a month, he was reading uh, books and he could write letters on the computer and stuff like that. But when it came to like actually writing with a pen and a paper, um, that was really, really difficult, uh, difficult for him because he, uh, he didn't and he still yeah. doesn't actually have the motor skills to be able to, you know, write the, le uh, the letters, etc. Uh, the way they are supposed to be in his head. So it gives him a lot of frustration as well, because A, you know, he's really not, not as good as it. Um, in it as the other kids who make it look easy and he's used to being um, to things being easier for him than for the other kids um, and um, be there's a lot of frustration there because he think basically thinks in uh, images he's got a lot of images in his head and in his head it looks a certain way and then he tries to write it and it doesn't look at all like yeah. what he's envisioning um, and that gives him a lot of frustration to an extent that he's writing something and basically he has to tear up the paper or scratch uh, scratch it over or um, basically we just have to make it disappear because this doesn't look good um, and that is just one example of how you know he's like certain different ages within one body like at He's 10 years old right now. And at a cognitive level, he's probably like, I don't know, like 14, but his handwriting is that of a six-year-old, basically. Right. And same goes for other examples as well. And I know a lot of parents that I know with other gifted kids that um, they understand that. M might not be with the handwriting, although that's quite quite common I feel because I've heard it uh, a bunch of times but it's with other examples as well and when he's at school and they want to give him like extra work and extra stuff to do to make his basically his day more challenging and to make sure that you know his fire doesn't doesn't um, burn out and he's basically still enjoying actually learning something um most of the time they just want to be able to give him some extra work and have him work on his own in a corner somewhere and work on projects but that's something that he cannot do because you know it, it, it they feel like he's uh, at a cognitive level like a 14 year old so they expect him to behave like a 14 year old would but he doesn't, basically, he doesn't do that uh, because obviously he is not 14 and there's some things uh, like every, every person, there's some things you're stronger at and there's other things that you're not so strong at. Um, yeah, is that something that you run into more often, like also with the expectations of the surroundings and the kids not being able to uh, deal with the differences and accept them themselves. And, and asynchrony is one of the hardest things for, I think, for, for schools, for the systems that work with our kids. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you see a 10-year-old, most 10-year-olds are 10-year-old in everything they do. They talk like 10-year-olds, they act like 10-year-olds, they think like 10-year-olds, they have emotions and friendships yeah. and sports like 10-year-olds. But when you're a gifted kid, all of that energy that goes into developing the brain early on, it comes at a cost, right? It, it shows up in this asynchrony, you know? And, and any time things don't hold together, when there's distance between things, that distance fills up with tension. And yeah. tension lead, can lead to problematic behaviors or big feelings, you know, and there's a young man I worked with. Um, I reference him a lot, actually, you know, he's eight years old. He's doing graduate level calculus work, right? So he's far, he's far paced every math person yeah. I know. And I know a lot of math people and he can't tie his shoes. And he'll say to me, Dr. Matt, how, how is it that I'm a genius in math? And I understand I'm a genius in math, but I can't tie my shoes. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? 
because your normal eight-year-old isn't doing graduate level calculus, but can tie his shoes. And, and it's tough to convince your child or a system that those differences are okay when they're clearly causing pain, when they're causing our kids to melt down or get upset yes. or struggle in class. You know, I'm sure your son has beautiful ideas and pictures and concepts in his brain because his brain is asynchronous and the intellectual piece of it is well past his age. But the ability to get those thoughts out onto paper, whether it's being writing words or drawing pictures or painting, absolutely, is a struggle. And I feel like that transfer is a struggle for many, many gifted kids, right? It's much better up here in our brains than it is spoken, written, or, or created. And there's a cost that comes with creating that, which I think a lot of our kids struggle with and what's kind of where perfectionism comes from. Yeah. There's also, when it's an asynchrony piece, we say, okay, so if you're having trouble getting your own words out, can you tell me what you feel? Can you use voice to text and, and speak this into a computer so the words come out? And then we edit the words that, that, you, took, that, you, that you said. You know, I have, a, I have a kid I work with who is a really brilliant thinker and, and he engages deeply with things. He, he has dyslexia, so he's not a strong reader. And we actually, he actually came to us, um, well, he came to the school I used to work at because he kept failing tests. Mm -hmm. He could write fine, but he, when they asked him to read multiple choice or short answer questions, he couldn't read them. So he was failing the tests. And which of course was making him really upset because he's like, I know the answers. I just can't tell you what you're asking me. So what he and I would do is he would sit in my office and I would read him the test, you know? So, you know, what is the capital of France, right? London, Paris, Rome, or Athens? Well, Paris, clearly. Okay, great. Next one. You know, what is the capital of Norway, right? And we would just pop down the list. But if you ask him to read those things, he wasn't doing it. And that's, that's a piece of this asynchrony, right? That, is, that, is that something you feel like they should be doing um, in our schools as well? Because basically they understand that he needs more advanced work, but you know they won't give it to him um, often because you know they don't accept the level of uh, asynchrony uh, that is there or they don't understand it. You feel like you know, he should be able to get the work at the cognitive level that he can, but they should just accommodate the things that he's diffing, having difficulty with, like, for example, not handwriting, but being able to do it on the computer, on the computer, or I'm just thinking, you know, in solutions here. Is that something you feel school should accommodate for him to be able to, um, to develop himself? Yeah. I think, I think schools have to, and, and it's one of those things that there's often hesitance to put in accommodations to help yeah. people help our kids do what they need to do. And to which I almost always reply, okay, so we're either going to spend some time building an accommodation and helping a kid do better, or we're going to spend the time picking him up and putting him back together after he melts down. Yeah. Either way, we're spending the time. Why not spend the time helping a kid succeed and do better and feel better? You know, I mean, it's, so here's a good example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I like to cook. I'm a pretty good cook, right? And I'm a much better cook than I am a baker. Uh, baking is very exact. It's very yeah. measured. It, the timing matters and the order you put ingredients in. Whereas if I'm making a cheeseburger, I'm putting some stuff in a bowl and I'm mixing it together and I put it on the grill and then it's a cheeseburger and it's delicious. Yeah. So I'm much better at cooking than baking. So if I'm going to bake, I need extra support, right? I need someone to help me measure things. I need the directions written out in a particular way. So now if I was in cooking school, they might say, well, you know, but that's not how we do it here. So, okay, then I'm going to fail your baking class and I'm going to get upset. And then I'm going to stick around because I can't finish your school unless I pass baking class. So 
maybe if I'm telling you this is the thing I need to to work to my potential, because if I if I have the support and structure, I, I can bake very delicious things. I just need more support to do so. And I think when teachers, when schools hear it that way, it's that I'm not asking yeah. for a handout, I'm asking for a hand up, right? I'm not asking for you to do it for me. I'm asking you to allow me to do it in a way that works for me. I think that's when we get where things start to really work together. Yeah. Um, and, and it takes a lot of trust. It takes trust from the, from the parent into the school, the child into the parent, the child into the school, and the school's got to trust that the kid's going to do it. So there's a lot of trust to build, but it's trust. It's a chance worth taking. And, you know, I, I often say to the school, right? Like, okay, you've been trying it this way for a while. You've been trying to make this tent, this kid write, and this kid is not a strong writer. So he's melting down, he's screaming, he's going to, going yeah. to the office, he's disrupting class. And you keep saying, well, this kid's got to write. He's got to learn how to write. I, nobody's disagreeing with you. But what, a, but what about this, this path we're on right now makes you think this is working? Like after he gets upset 15 days in a row on the 16th day, he's going to wake up and goes, ah, now I can write. <laughs> he's getting more upset. He's getting more traumatized. Like, let's stop and try a different path. And the worst thing that happens is we're back where we started. Worst thing that happens is nothing changes, right? And, and it's the sort of thing that if we let ourselves think creativity, creatively and try different pathways, I think oftentimes we get closer to the answer rather than sort of holding on very tightly to this idea we had that must be the right idea because that was the idea I had. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's often how I feel about it. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely agree. And I hope that a lot of schools here in the Netherlands listen to this podcast as well, because uh, you, you guys know, totally I, should, you totally should listen to our podcast. Yeah, you so. should. <laughs> <laughs> Shame on you if you don't. <laughs> but yeah, they should they should listen to this um, because you know I feel like currently in the Netherlands um, we're not thinking. You know, there's a lot of cases where people are not thinking uh, in solutions and they're just doing things because that's the way they always do things. Um, but here there are even some statistics that over uh, 50% of the gifted people don't uh, get a diploma which matches their capabilities. So I think, you know, we should, you know, make, make some adjustments to make things work for them or otherwise, you know, they're not going to uh, live up to their potential, uh, basically. So, yeah, they... Uh, would be great if they could listen to this. <laughs> we hope they do, right? And someday we will knock on all of their doors and we will say, you know, two things that every kid, every kid, gifted kid or not, kids need to put their strengths forward. We need to lead yeah. with the kids strengths and we need to be creative in how we approach things that are hard. So, if you have a kid who's a talented artist, right? Drawing, painting, sculpting, whatever that is, yeah. right? And this kid doesn't want to doesn't want to write an essay. Why can't this kid draw a comic book about the Dutch Revolution? Why not? Right? Why not think that way? If we play to our kids' strengths, they develop skills faster, they develop resiliency faster, they develop self-esteem faster, and they develop trust Absolutely. faster. You know, I don't need some, you know, I don't need my eight-year-old who can't tie his shoes to spend four hours every day trying to tie his shoes. That's not a good use of his time, my time, his family's time. Absolutely. So right now we are doing, we're doing um, slip-on shoes to school and he does a weekly appointment with his occupational therapist where they spend 30 minutes trying to tie shoes. And it's, it's something that's we farmed out. It's a thing that they just do. And his fine mortar skills are, are improving, right? And what we found there is that it wasn't tying the shoes that was that was working. It was untying knots, right? So we, they gave him really? a tie thing of, in, he, that, that helped the problem solving part yeah. of his brain. He liked that. So he started playing with it. And now he's much more dexterous with string. 
still can't tie the shoes, but now the comfort level, the tactile piece is there. So I feel like we're like, we're the, you know, we're, by the end of this year, I think he'll be able to tie his shoes. Fingers crossed again. Yeah. But that, yeah. that's the thing, right? It's how are we spending our time should be on strengths and comfort and, and skills rather than discomfort, trauma, and forced learning. <laughs> Yeah. Plus, what I really liked about your example, like untie with the, the untying knots uh, thing, is that you're actually reframing it. Because my son, you know, in the past, he used to get a lot of help, uh, and every time it's like, "You can't do this, so we're going to offer you help A. You can't do this, so we're going to help you um, with with help B." Um, but this is like not you know, you're not able to tie your shoes and we're going to teach you how to tie your shoes. But this was something that he actually enjoyed doing. You know, if, 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 if I hear your story co correctly, like untying things, so you're reframing it. Plus he's learning the skills to, uh, to tie his shoes, basically, hopefully at the end of, uh, end of the year as well. So I really like that about your story uh, story as well, that it doesn't become a frustration in itself to learn how to do that. And, I mean, and I'm glad that it came across, right? And that's, you know, it's, it's funny because we tend to want to add these big complex systems to solve yeah. problems. And most of the time it's, we have the skills and the solutions we need inside of us, it's just building an environment that allows them to come out. And that's, you know, I think that's, that's tricky for a lot of people to wrap their head around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, we got a lot of valuable things uh, out of this podcast. So I really, really want to uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to have this talk with you today. Um, and again, for the people who haven't seen your webinars, they should absolutely register and uh, watch them as well, because they're absolutely um, valuable. And they really helped us as a family out a lot um, over the past two years. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, if I know of any, I'll post them on my socials as well. So uh, people will know where to register and when. Um, yeah, is there anything you would still like to share with the people listening to this podcast before we go? I think I think the last thing when it comes to asynchronous development in general, mm -hmm. right, is that is we can't speed up that process, right? We can't force our 10-year-old who thinks like a 15-year-old that has the emotional, emotional control of an eight-year-old to suddenly have the emotional control of a 15-year-old. It doesn't work that way. But the idea here is we meet our kids where we are and, and we work forward from there. So if your 10 year old has the social skills of a six year old, we teach, that's where we start the process. We don't say, I need you to be at 10. So let's be yeah. at 10. It's that bottom up thinking versus top down thinking thing again. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so what I say to parents and professionals is, once you get a sense of where those skills are, those are your roadmaps. And yes, it would be easier if they were all the same thing. That would Absolutely. be, but, but we have to parent the kid we have, not the kid we want. So, you know, and this is for teachers too. We teach the kid we have, not the kid we want. Yeah. The idea here is what, what we call reasonable rigor. What is challenging enough for the kid to grow based on where that kid is at this moment. So a 10-year-old who does math like a 15-year-old, reasonable rigor is the next difficult thing in math, maybe calculus, yeah. maybe trigonometry, we don't know. But if that same kid has the social skills of a six-year-old, then we're going to work on things like eye contact and shaking hands and naming feelings, not, hey, do you want to have a sleepover at my house? Because that kid will fail at that and feel worse. Yeah. Just yeah. as if we gave the 10-year-old, you know, addition for math homework, they're going to fail at it because it's too easy, right? So reasonable rigor based on where kids are is the path forward. And what you'll find is kids ultimately come together. They ultimately catch up with themselves. It's our job to support them as they do that. 
wise last words and i really really want to thank you for uh this conversation again i'm yeah. sure it's going to help a lot of parents who are having difficulty with this um i sure hope so i mean this you know i i think we're talking about some really important things and you know you're so easy to talk to so i you know i thank think you. that so yeah thank you so much and um, i really really appreciate this and i'm sure we'll see each other again in the virtual world i sure thank hope you. so, so yeah so take care of yourself stay well and i and i look forward to the next time we talk talk again mocht je na het luisteren van deze podcast nog meer informatie willen over dit onderwerp mijn boek Een Intense Reis is te koop via uitgeverij SWP, swpboek.com slash 2349 of de online of lokale boekwinkel. Ook kun je voor meer informatie altijd terecht op www.eenintensereis.nl. Muziek